Hi, it's Dr. Noel Williams, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, Optimal Health Associates, COVID update, July 21st, 2020. <laughs> so news of the day. So 615 hospitalized patients in Oklahoma, about 670 new cases, I believe, yesterday. Big snafu in the software in Oklahoma, so it's going to be very hard to get accurate data in terms of uh, positive tests for the next few days to a week, and there may be no reconciliation. The software for the state's gotten discombobulated, which happens, it's life. And so trying to integrate results from places like CVS and Quick Clinics into the database has gone awry. And so who knows what we're gonna be ha looking at. So the data is gonna be a little, little bit off. The important point though, is there's about 615 patients in the hospital, that's a lot. Uh, shout out to all the wonderful nurses, respiratory techs, clerical staff, doctors, nurse practitioners, PAs, who are doing everything they can to keep these people alive and, and help them get better. Uh, I mean, what else can you say about that? Um, it's a little scary we have that many people in, but remember, it is predominantly still older people, but there is a, a large number of people, 20 to 40 now. Um, I don't have the exact breakdown of those numbers. That's not possible to get, but there is a substantial proportion, 40 to 50%, maybe under 40. The expectation is those patients will do well. Uh, unfortunately, the people who do get hospitalized do have about a 50% chance of um, long-term side effects from COVID. And some of the people, as I've told you, uh, can have some long-term side effects with just significant disease. So just things to keep in mind. As I talked about last night, um, I was gonna put on a, an article by Dr. Bida uh, Stradler from Switzerland. He clearly defines that there's some immunity pre-existing in the populations in Germany and in China and that there is an immune response to COVID. Now, one thing to keep in mind if you read that article, to be clear, he's a very brilliant, world-renowned, top two, three guy in immunology. So when he's talking and writing about these things, he's within a ballywick of specific meaning. So when he's saying the coronavirus, or COVID is just another bat coronavirus, cold, cold, bat cold coronavirus or something like that. It seems like he's diminishing the virus. He's not diminishing the virus. He's just putting it within a fam family of viruses. Those viruses he knows very well, the SARS and MERS kill people, killed tons of people. He understands COVID kills tons of people. His point is though, that it is just a virus that causes colds. Since we have no immunity, it can kill us just like viruses that the Europeans came over to when they came to North America and just gave them cold viruses and then more significant gastrointestinal viruses and bacteria. It decimated the North American and Central American Indian population. One of the things I did not believe to be clear years ago was that it killed um, for up to 40 million Native Americans. But when I did the research, I was like, no, the estimate is it killed 40 million Native Americans over the course of 50 or 60 years and kind of led to a global cooling. It's really interesting data if you're ever bored if, to look at that because what happened, the reforestation from the Native Americans being decimated by viruses and flu and stuff um, caused their crops, the, the corn to go away. So very interesting stuff, but that's here nor there. So the point with Dr. Stradler is that we can have immunity. We can be protected against COVID. We've blown it at first. He makes that very clear. He talks about, not because of any other reason that we are all scared beyond everything. He said he was scared, so he didn't process. He had to break away from that. So he did. And so now we have great science coming. Uh, further great science out of Switzerland is that there's pretty definitive proof on hydroxychloroquine. I'll, point, I'll put the study out tomorrow. Uh, and this is the thing. These are real doctors doing real studies, not some government funded group who has agendas that sets like our FDA did every study to fail. So what happened in Switzerland is there, that's where the World Health Organization exists. It, their headquarters are in Bern, Switzerland. So when the, so they follow the government there follows their recommendations very closely. So when they recommended formally to stop all hydroxychloroquine at the end of May, the Swiss medical establishment stopped it within 24 hours. Their death rate was at the bottom 
of any of countries in terms of COVID death using hydroxychloroquine, which they'd used the whole time. So they stopped. 14 days later, they had a 300% rise in deaths from COVID. Two or three days after that, who reversed that decision not to use hydroxychloroquine? They added it back. 13 days later, they had a 75% drop, which has continued um, subsequently because they've used the hydroxychloroquine. So it's a great illustrative live action model of what happens. You have people on hydroxychloroquine, they have uh, only about a 25% of the death rate compared to people not on it. You stop it, it goes back up to the norm across the world where countries aren't using it. You restart it, it drops right back down two weeks later because it's you know the wash of the people who are being treated. So beautifully done, very clear, elegant, no black and white. These are the Swiss. I mean, they make watches. I mean, they are, I mean, it is like that. No one has an agenda there. If they had an agenda, it was against hydroxychloroquine because the World Health Organization won't sign on to it because they're all about vaccines. So um, I don't know what else to tell people except I'll put the link to the study. I will put the graphs if you have a hard time reading or listening. <laughs> because that can always be helpful, because um, it's a picture. And if it's a picture, maybe you can understand it, that people all across the world, these scientists and doctors aren't lying, um, but they're finding great results. And likewise, if you, don't, if you get sick with um, COVID, please don't ask your doctor or anyone to give you hydroxychloroquine, and we can see what happens. Um, but that would be silly, because you really want the hydroxychloroquine. So enough of that. Uh, what other topics, Kim? Anything else? I'm trying to think. I don't want to ramble too much tonight. Um, um, you need to post your. Oh, list of the list. I'll do that. I'm. I will have time tomorrow. I will post a list of how to do everything. And, and again, it's vitamin D. It's zinc. It's melatonin. It's thinking about the elderberry, and a few other things. So I will post it all once again. Um, so we'll do that. Um, there was one other thing I wanted to talk about. Oh, Heritage Hall, locally, school administrators. Uh, I had a meeting tonight with them with another physician, Bill Bondurant, to f do some finalizing on their rollout plan for return to school. So if you happen to be a Heritage Hall parent in Oklahoma City, be very thankful that we have such brilliant and wonderful school administrators who've put this great plan together and are now going through it with a fine tooth comb to actually get school open on time on August 12th. Uh, and it illustrated to me that school administrators and teachers everywhere are working their butts off to try to get these schools open. And they should be open and they need to be open for our kids. I mean, kids need to get educated. They need to be educated when possible in person. It is safe, safe, safe for kids to go to school. I mean, this baloney that it's it's dangerous needs to end. The World Health Organization data, the British Medical Journal data, j data from all over the world shows it's incredibly safe. Now, do we have to have safeguards? Absolutely. There, and that's what the school administrators are doing. Kids need to wear masks. The teachers need to wear masks. There needs to be a plastic partition between them. There's great success doing that across the country. So again, in terms of different models in, in businesses and things. And plus, we have great data showing that it doesn't increase when schools reopen or stay open. So that's what you have to understand. Now, remember, masks in little kids, you're not really, we have to understand this. You're doing the masks for, in younger children, not because there's much chance they're going to spread the virus. 11 and under, incredibly unlikely. 14 and under, really, really unlikely. The issue is statistics have exceptions. And so every life is important. And if every life is important, we need to protect all the teachers' lives because the little kids almost never get sick. Their overall risk of death from COVID, if you're under 14, is like one in 9 million or 12 million. It's some astronomically teeny number. So the teachers, though, have some risk. So by protecting them with both groups wearing masks, we lower risk. Now, it's not a huge lowering in risk because it's so small, but we need to be respectful and we need to get more data. So it's that simple. High school students, again, 15, 16, like I talked about, not very likely to be spreaders if they get infected, but still possible 17, 18 can spread. Again, they shouldn't be super spreaders, they'd be a small risk. But again, masks, partitions, 
cleaning, being respectful with distances, those things make it possible. So that's what we have to remember. Schools need to open. That's going to make a lot of people mad. It's going to make teachers mad when I say that. But the reality is we have to go with science. The sociologic impact of not having kids in school for a whole nother year and doing this reasonably meaningless virtual teaching for humanities courses and for things that really involve the didactic, I don't think it's as important for science and math. Not that I'm belittling science and math as a science and math person, but Again, you need that hands-on approach, especially when they're little kids. How are you going to learn to read if you can't have the teacher next to you pronouncing the word with at least a partition and she sounding out the word or he sounding out the word and the students sounding out the word? That's how it works. How are you going to do that? How are you going to get a first grader to read with a mask on and at home? It isn't going to happen. So, and again, when I'm saying without a mask, it's through a partition because you still have to be able to do some of that. And with a six-year-old, uh, it's safe. So that's what we have to realize and be respectful. Because the other part is all of us adults are going to get COVID. <laughs> and it's five times more likely you're going to get it at home from a family member or loved one than it's ever going to be in the community. That data was out today too. So again, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So have your nutritional status knocked out and you're gonna be in good shape and then have a good relationship with your provider and maybe they'll give you Plaquenil at the first sign of illness or positive culture. So that's what we can do and that's the update. Good night, thank you.